And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Krishnanan, a five-time award-winning author, expert in religious studies and spiritual practices, and two-times near-death experiencer. His latest NDE in 2013 placed him in a stage three Glasgow coma where he remained fully conscious in a celestial dimension he now calls the portal. He awoke from the coma nine days later on his birthday, having no memory of his name, partner of 11 years, or his 20-year-old son. Krishnanan, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Jeff. It's, of course, glad to be here. Thank you. Let's start with your first NDE and go from there. Okay. I'm glad you know about that. I don't really talk much about it because I didn't know much about it myself until sort of studying NDE when I first knew what NDE was. Like, oh my God, looks like I had one to begin with. So it was when I was born. I was born a nuchal baby. That is what they also refer to as a blue baby. My umbilical cord was around my neck and I was virtually dead when I came out. And so the doctors revived me and... I never thought much about it until I started studying NDE and learning about all this kind of standard, some of the more standard side effects and consequences and effects of NDE experience. And I'm like, oh my God, that explains a lot because I was already born into having past life regressions when I was two and three years old. I was kind of confused like I was with this latest NDE. I was kind of confused as to which dimension and which lifetime I was in because the, the, the boundaries and layers of them were overlapping. And so I didn't know who I was in my identity because my awareness was identifying with multiple identities, people I'd been in past lives and well as well as this one. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't separate them. So I had that going on when I was born. It's pretty wild. And I, if I may, I learned to not talk about it because by three years old, I'm thinking like, if I talk about this stuff, People are going to think I'm crazy and they're going to put, and they're going to lock you up. And I'm thinking literally, this is my cognizant thoughts at three years old. What do you know about being crazy? What do they, what do you know about locking people up? Cause they're crazy. You're three. What do you, what do you, how do you know this? And this is my inner dialogue. I like three years old. And again, I just want to be quiet about it. And as is kind of common and standard for any experiences that are very intense, it's about, it takes about seven years for it to totally kind of, kind of stabilize. And sure enough, by seven years old, I completely stabilized. I didn't think much about it. Have you ever been regressed at any point later in your life and remembered that NDE? Not until I started to work with it and do some meditations re relatively recently in the last seven, eight years of this one. Um, certainly, and again, it's not something that even like this one, I don't really feel the, see the value in connecting with the event itself. Why would I remember being blue and choking? And so... I have some awareness of it, but rather abstractly because I don't really see the value or anything reasonably uh, valuable to kind of remember it and relive it. Well, maybe it's possible you weren't in your body when all that was happening. That's very possible and likely. Yeah, again, I, I, either way, I'm an infant, my, so I wouldn't remember it either way. And, so, and it could be very well that. And as we talk about my, my, my adult NDE, that you're, what, you, what you just said was go, is going to be absolutely verified. All right, well, let's move forward to that one. Okay. So I think it's worth giving you a little bit of a detailed version because you will see little miracles that aren't too little, one after the other. So everything I'm going to explain to you has a part in this. Even the parts that may seem rather trivial, you'll see as it unfolds, oh my God, that part was very important too. I was a private practice counselor. I had turned away from my other career as a contractor, hit a 180, and had somehow succeeded without having a college degree or anything, and I was doing wonderful work by helping and saving people, and I was very, very blessed to do that. I went from a few clients a week to specializing in addiction, which I knew, and going to 10 hours a day, six to seven days a week, helping a lot of people. Suddenly that day, I had three clients text me to reschedule. It happens but never three in a row. Suddenly I went from a full back-to-back -back day of clients to see to having four hours with nothing to do. I didn't bring any backup work because I was booked all day. And so that particular day, again, God is in the details. That particular day, I didn't ride my car. I rode my bike, motorcycle. It's a very unusual Italian scooter. 
very unusual. 500 cc, very unusual, and that, that's gonna be important too. And for seven years I've been in that office, Jeff, and with the sudden open of four hours of my schedule, I learned later, because I didn't remember this, I learned later from her that I called my girlfriend and I told her this and I asked her to come on a hike with me. And she said, I can't, I gotta go to work and blah, blah, blah. And I said, all right, I guess I'll go up the street to get a physical that I'm overdue for. I get to walk in clinic. And so I go downstairs. So these things are kind of lining up. I go downstairs in the parking garage. I change my, excuse me, I change my clothes. And I go downstairs again in the parking garage and I get on my bike and open the gate. And for the first time in seven years in that office, I turned right instead of left. To this day, I do not know why. I never, ever turned right instead of left when I left that garage because the left turn was a quiet side street into town. The right turn was a boulevard. To this day, I never know why for the one time ever that I turned right instead of left, but I did. About a quarter of a mile away is an intersection. And as I pause at the, the light, I had a green left turn arrow just for me. I was the only guy in the lane. Left turn green arrow. Not just a green yield, caution, but a green arrow. And as I ease out to make my left turn, an SUV went through the light and hit me in the face, killing me instantly. Dead on the street, mangled and bloody and dead. Now, when we talk about that moment, that event of trying to remember it, I can tell you this, this is where my NDE sometimes differs from, from some of the, some that I've read about. I didn't have the OBE, the OB out of body experience. I didn't hover around. I was hit in the face and killed and my spirit, my consciousness, my soul, so to speak, catapulted. It was like, I'm out of here. I do not need to be here for this. And I left and went to the other side, what I now call the portal. I had no reason to be there. It was traumatizing, it was terrible. And so I left. Didn't hover one second. On the corner was a tire store. And in front of the tire store was a pastor of all people helping his daughter get tires on his car that day. And he was on a cell phone and he saw the accident and ran over there first, thinking to himself, God put me here for a reason this day. So I don't know when the emotions are gonna come up. It's not just the pain, it's the blessings. I mean, that right there just blows my mind. He's the first one that pulled, he started pulling me from the wreck. I was bleeding from my eyes, my nose, my mouth, and my ears, and I was dead. And he began to read me my last rites because he's a pastor. Now, I did not know about this until about two years ago when I had some innocuous conversation with my ex-wife, my, my, my son's mother, that I don't really have much of a relationship with, and she was rambling on about something and said, you know, Pastor Tom, and I said, who? She goes, oh, my God, you don't remember. They had to pull you from the wreck. I didn't even know about this until a couple of years ago. On the other corner is a jack-in-the-box. At the front of the drive through line with two paramedics getting lunch. They wanted burgers instead of tacos that day, I would not be here. Had they been in the back of that line, behind cars, I would not be here. They saw the accident occur as it happened, and they were on it in seconds, bring me a body back to life. I was on the other side. My consciousness was no longer here. I, have, I, didn't, I don't have no memory or view of this scene at all. I was somewhere else and I didn't care. So I found out about all this stuff after the fact from the people that told me about it. I was in a stage three Glasgow coma, which is synonymous with death. EMT and medical emergency workers will tell you that literally stage three, they shrug their shoulders and say, it's up to God now. There's nothing they can do. They can try to keep your heart beating and keep you on respirators, et cetera, but there's nothing they can do to help you live. They put me in, they took me to ICU. Behind that jack in the box is a DMV. My son's best friend happened to be in the parking lot and saw the accident too. This is unusual too, because he lives nowhere near the area, is never in that area, and that particular day, at that particular time, he had a rare errand to run that required him to be there at DMV. Also, the emotions come because I know the pain that it caused. When I get to this part, it always breaks me up. 
because he called my son and said, Brandon, your dad's been in an accident. So what are you talking about? How do you know it's my dad? Because it's his bike. No one has a bike like that. It's your dad. He's going to be putting him into an ambulance. He's going to the hospital. This is significant too, because no one would have known about my accident because all of my personal belongings, my wallet, phone, et cetera, were jettisoned from the wreck and scattered. Because of this boy being on the corner at that time, calling my son, my family was able to go to the hospital. They were met by two doctors and a priest. Not a good sign. And they were told, if he ever wakes up, which by the way, he won't, no one ever has waken from a stage three Glasgow since 1980, one person has. It ain't gonna happen. They're trying to ease them into the reality. If he wakes up, he will likely be a vegetable. He will never be able to take care of himself. And those scars and those lacerations you see along his, along his face, even with extensive plastic surgery, he will never look the same. This is me today. My girlfriend fainted at that moment. Her response when the doctors told her this was, oh, okay, so we'll wake up a little while and we'll take him home. As denial crashed in and her daughter turned her and said, oh my God, did you not hear what they just said? And she was in total denial. So I'm, excuse me, she did not faint at that time. She just said, okay, we'll take him home soon. <laughs> Nine days later on my birthday, I woke up. Of all days on my birthday, that's when she fainted. The moment I opened my eyes and they said I was awake, she was in the room and she fainted because suddenly she could accept what had happened before. Pardon me. I've always had some feelings of shame and guilt because I don't want to be a source of pain for anybody. And one of the first grateful things I had was that I was alone on my bike that day, that I rarely allowed my son or my girlfriend to be passengers on my bike, but I did occasionally. We often went out. And I was so grateful, excuse me, to be alone on my bike that day. So there's a picture, which we can send to you if you like, of me sitting in a hospital bed First, the first one is I got a respirator on, a tube down my throat. I got carts and scars all over my face. So you can see the lacerations that, by the way, on my birthday, when I woke up, I didn't have a scratch on me. And we've got a bag full of miracles here. I got a pastor on one corner, a paramedic on the other corner, my son's best friend on the other, on, on behind, the, behind the one corner. I wake up on my birthday I have a DAI brain injury. It's a diffuse axonal injury. It's the most severe TBI, traumatic brain injury, known to science. It's when the white and gray layers of your brain shift and separate. And all the billions of neurons that you have that are responsible for tasks like moving your finger, smiling, opening your eyes, they separate, and they don't know how to do what they're doing anymore. And you can't reteach them. You have to... Well, you have to literally reteach them. You can't remember. You, you have to reteach it. So the next photo that they took of me in the hospital is with my son and my girlfriend's daughter standing next to me with a cupcake and a happy birthday balloon. And I have no idea what's going on. There's a little video of them singing happy birthday to me, and I look like I kind of know what's going on. And I, have no, I don't even know what a birthday is. When I woke up from my coma, Jeff, I did not know my name. I didn't know who I was. These are my tears. I did not know what a hospital was. I did not know how to walk. I did not know how to talk. I'm not saying that I forgot. I'm saying it was deleted. I was like an infant. I'd gone through reincarnation experience. I was starting fresh from scratch. I did not know who my son was. Didn't know who my girlfriend was, who had been with 11 years. Didn't even know what a girlfriend was. Didn't even know what a son was. I'm learning all this as quickly as I can, as fast as I can, and it's all new to me. And the only way that I can try to explain it is that I will say that it was as if my identity was deleted. Everything that I was and had been through and experienced, all my memories and everything else was completely gone, like it never happened. 
So that's event number two. That's NDE number two. Now, I think it's interesting to say, I think it's worth pointing out that that's kind of the medical clinical area. I'm having two experiences. There's this practical, material, worldly event going on with my body and all this. Meanwhile, I, the nine days I'm in a coma, I forgot to mention that, that's significant too. As a numerologist, I can tell you that nine is a very mystical number. It means endings and closures. I was in a coma for nine days of all, of all the time and I woke up on my birthday. And the entire nine days that I'm in this, my body's in a coma, my soul is there because I already know that your soul is your like battery pack. You're, it animates your body. Without a soul, no, no, no life. My consciousness, on the other hand, is not bound by material matter. It can be free, and it was. My consciousness, my chitta in Sanskrit, was on the other side within the portal the entire time. And I'm having a nonstop series of events and what I would refer to as uploads of information, of knowledge, of past life regressions. I'm watching it all like a cinema the entire time I'm there. I'm having this ongoing relationship with these, what I now refer to as Akashic agents. You could say guardian angels. You could say, you could refer to it as anything you want. They are a loving presence that are there to support you, comfort you, et cetera. And so I just stayed there. I'm like, I'm cool. Like, I don't need to go anywhere. Like, do you know what's going on with you? And I'm like, yeah, I get it. And I don't really have any questions and I don't really need anything. And I'm totally cool. Like, I have no desires. I have only one desire. I want, I felt God's presence at that point as a female presence of love. And I, and I felt that the almighty, powerful presence of God was more male. And I just, only one desire I had was to please her. If she wanted me to go back, if she wanted me to stay, whatever it was, I just wanted to do whatever she wanted. I experienced the life review, which is common and pretty standard for NDE experiences. I also experienced a life preview. Everyone gets these when you die. Whether you come back in this life or next, bottom line is everyone gets them. But few people remember the life preview where you see what you're coming back to. It was uploaded to my consciousness that what we get in our life preview and review is proportionate to and kind of based on what your level is, you could say, with mystical and spiritual training and practice. Because I'd already spent my entire life dedicated to spiritual, spiritual medical and, and mystical practices I guess I was qualified for a lot. So my life preview was not just of this lifetime. I saw hundreds, thousands of past lives. And I requested, and I air quote, because there's not like a dialogue. It's all telepathic, you could say. And I said, I'm not interested in life previews of lifetimes. I have nothing to do with my soul's journey to divinity. I only want to see the lifetimes that I can learn from where I went wrong and what I did right on my soul's journey to progress towards divinity. The life preview was terrifying. I saw what I was going back to. I wasn't looking forward to it. Severe brain trauma, no memory, no identity, feeling isolated, feeling disconnected, not being able to relate to anyone or anything for some time. I knew what I was going back to, and I said, let's do it, let's get it over with. What else can you do? It was shared with me, and again, I'm air quoting because that's not like exactly like dialogues like you and I are having. And feel free to interrupt anytime if you have a question. That, so when I say I was wondering or I asked, again, there's air quotes. I, I thought, I didn't even think. It's like things I wanted to know were just there. I didn't, I didn't even want to know them. They're just like things I would be curious about were just there. It's hard to describe. It's ineffable. And it was, so... People talk about seeing passed on loved ones and they see Jesus or whatever it may be. They have spiritual experiences, religious experience, et cetera. I'm not really seeing anything like that. I'm just in this spaceless, timeless, comfortable, 
dimension where I have no like sensations or senses or anything like that. And they said to me, do you need it? Those are primarily giving people to comfort them through the death experience. And that's customized to who and what they are and what their belief systems are. God is everything. God is everywhere. God is omniscient and omnipresent. So whether God takes on the form of Jesus or Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the Buddha, God can take any form or pass on loved ones or pets or whatever, whatever is going to help these people transition comfortably and adjust to this potentially traumatizing experience is what they're given. Do you need any of these things? And I was like, no, I don't. I'm completely comfortable with what's happening. I know what's going on. It's fine. And I'm in good hands and I don't. I'd rather just rest. And the answer was good because you're going to need it. Take this time to just unplug for a little while because what you're going back to is going to be very, very difficult. So as I woke from the coma, and I was introduced to my son, I'm going to be a lot of air quotes here, my wife, girlfriend. I'm experiencing multiple dimensions and lifetimes at once. When I'm, my body is asleep, my consciousness is fully awake and early within the portal the entire time. Like fully awake, like, like, a, like I'm entering a classroom that's already mid, mid, in, going on. Like I just entered the room and the class has been going on for a while. There's like a conversation already taking place and I'm just joining it. And when I was awake, when my body was awake, my consciousness was partly in the world, but still mostly in the portal. And so I'm very confused. I'm looking at the people that I know and my first words as I'm starting to learn how to speak to my son and to my son and my girlfriend were, what are you doing in London? This is because I now know, which I did not know then. It took a while to understand this because my last life, I was in London and we were together. We knew each other in various ways. Many people that you're closely associated with, you've had recent past lives with, that's why our karmas bind us together. And so I didn't think I was in London, Jeff. Ah, it's where I was. Like I know where I'm at right now in my house, in my little dining area. On the on 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 video call with you, I know where I'm at. That's that's not it's not a mystery to me. It's not something I suppose. I was in London. I was wondering how they got there so fast. And as I'm learning who they are, I'm like, yeah, I know you're Brandon. That's my son's name. I know you're Brandon, but why do you think that's all you are? Like I was really confused. Like why are you seeing each other as these identities? You're you're a string of ideas. You're a whole bunch of things. And I could not fathom, it was, was natural to me is that I was seeing everyone in, in their spiritual form, in their spiritual identities, not the material forms and identities. And it was very confusing to me because that's all I could see. And I could not understand why other people couldn't see it. And I was frustrated. I was like, why do you keep referring to yourself as Brandon? Why, why, why you, who's, the, who's Scott? Who's, that's my, my, my birth name. Who's, who's this Scott guy? Same thing when I was born, had my first NDE. I was like, who's this Scott guy? Not my parents. I don't know who you are. I don't know who my parents are, but you're not them. The lines between my identities, my spiritual identity and my persona identity were very blurred. And I could not, partly because of brain trauma, partly because of having such a severe NDE ongoing event that I was incapable of really separating and differentiating between them. It was all just one big existence. So my NDE was not a moment in time. It persisted as I traveled, you could say, and connected with and coexisted in within the portal intensely for four years. It continued less intensely as I learned how to find the volume knob and even sometimes the on-off switch when I want to need to, it continues to this day. I'm in regular contact with Akashic agents and the portal dimension. It's something that I am partly with all the time, you could say. So in a sense, I'm either very delusional because I think I'm living in two different dimensions at once, or it's literal and it's actual and I am. 
Now, I have often, through these 10 years of this very confusing set of experiences, often wondered and concluded, you're crazy. This doesn't make any logical, mathematical, practical sense. And yet as a spiritualist that had been there my whole life, I'm like, no, you're not. And the bottom line is, there's a reason why no one else thinks you're crazy too, because you're very cognizant, very intelligent, and very rational. You don't present like a crazy person. And as a behavioral specialist, as a counselor, I worked with crazy a lot throughout my career. I know the difference. And crazy people never think they're crazy. <laughs> they think everyone else is, but they think they're fine. It's one of the first signs I would see as a counselor that this person may not be, they might be just okay because they're actually doubting their sanity. Only insane people don't doubt their sanity. I had a lot of doubting my sanity. The events that unfolded for the next nine years, they say it takes typically seven years for your spirit to stabilize back in within your body. That's very common with intense NDEs. I can confirm that. In year seven is when it really did kind of find, find its way home. That's when I came here to live next to my spiritual ashram. And my consciousness shifted. I was making leaps and bounds in my recovery. It was night and day different. I wasn't confused anymore. And again, I found the volume and on-off switch. I've been able to, at will, connect as I want. And of course, sometimes the Akashic agents and the portal dimension, they beckon me. I mean, I definitely wake up, as many mystics do, at four in the morning. The reason that the, the people get messaged a lot at four in the morning area is because that's when your ego, your on car, Ahankar in Sanskrit, your ego, your identity is more dormant in sleep. It's not in the way. They can have access to your just raw consciousness. So while I can connect to the portal dimension and Akashic agents at will, they can also have access to me, as they always did. And I enjoy it. You know, it's um, I don't ever ask, and nor would I nor have I ever received any material insights. Only things that are relevant to my soul's journey, my spiritual reality, and my spiritual goals and work. And same when I read and counsel and mentor, and I consider myself something of a spiritual fitness trainer. I help people develop spiritually. I'm not a guru or a master. I can help you develop your spiritual self to be able to evolve it and mature it. Same as a fitness trainer helps you get healthy. And so as people often reach out to me because they have material concerns with family members or health issues or whatever it may be, I'm happy to delve into that, but it's always in a spiritual context. Why is this happening from a spiritual level? What's its spiritual source? And where can it take you spiritually? Not just how can I win the lottery, but if you did win the lottery, what would you do with that money in a spiritual context, not a material one? So I've said a whole lot, and I don't want to like completely exhaust myself for <laughs> you. Any questions, any comments? Uh, you want to you tell me how crazy I am yet? Well, you're definitely not crazy. The day that okay, it... Okay, I need you to document that. Uh -oh. I, need, I need that written down. I, I, want, I want that signed. I want, so it's... <laughs> well, it'll be here in this video for eternity. There you go, man, and for so eternity. There eternal is. truth, all the only truths that matter. On the day of your accident, there were synchronicities that appear to cause you to have this accident. That's the way I see it. Do you think it's possible that you planned this accident pre-birth? Okay, well, let me tell you this. I would never volunteer for this. What I went through was horrifying. But I can tell you that for sure, again, as a lifelong religious and spiritual scholar, who understands that in his life studying the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Buddhist teachings, biblical teachings, all of them, and I love them all. The big events of your life, such as death, are destined, predetermined, destined. So even if I would have stayed in bed that day, I would have been struck by lightning. The event itself and the magnitude of it was set and predetermined and set to happen. Now, you also have free will. That's, the, that's what God endows us with so that we can love the God power and serve the God power. 
So free will, even though this event is going to occur, what you do about it, how you deal with it is up to you. Now, when I woke up from my coma, some of my very first thoughts were, pardon my language, fuck this, I'm just gonna die. I don't wanna be a burden to everyone that loves me. That's all I'm gonna be. That's what the doctors are all saying. I'm definitely gonna be a burden. It's easier for everyone if I just check out. I'm just gonna hold my breath, will myself to die. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through this and I don't wanna be a burden to anybody else. I have free will. Call it Akashic agents, call it God himself, I don't know. But the message, the response that I heard from some other dimension was, but what if you triumphed? What if you persevered over this tragedy? Then what kind of an inspiration would you be then? This is what you represented to everyone you know throughout your life is a representation of triumph and effort. So maybe you can't get out of this. But what if you can and you do? What kind of an inspiration would you be then? And that was the moment while I was still lying in hospital bed, could not even get up, that I decided I'm going to live. And one of the other first words that I said as I struggled to speak was I told my girlfriend, I said, I don't know if I can ever learn to walk. And they're telling me I can't. But I can tell you this. If I can take one step, it becomes evidence I can take two. Sorry. If I can take one step, it becomes evidence I can take two. And I'm going to go as far as I can. I'm going to take those steps until I can't anymore. We're going to find out how far I can go. How far I became, three-time medical miracle. I am the only person in recorded history since 1980-something that has recovered from a stage three Glasgow and a DAI injury. 90% of DAI brain injuries, 90% are dead or institutionalized within four years, and they're dead by suicide. Within four years, 90%. The other 10 cannot take care of themselves. I'm playing tennis at two o'clock this afternoon. I don't play it well. I used to be a 4 player, 4.5, which is pretty, pretty good stuff. I'm nowhere near that. I don't have the balance and agility that I once had because of my brain trauma. But I get out there and I sweat my ass off and I work and I do my own chores, and I pack my own stuff to move soon. And I wrote a magnificent book. It's the best thing I've ever written. I was already a published author. And so what inspired me in that moment was, for some stupid reason, was, yes, I didn't care about me. It was like, this happened for a reason. As you said, there's like a conspiracy of synchronicity taking place. And of course, I'm... You can't help but see, and this is all documented, like this is absolutely documented evidence that I think is undeniable evidence of a spiritual power in charge of events. And eventually I had to agree that this isn't about me. Pastor on one corner, paramedic on the other, DA, I have all these, the synchronicity, as you said, of events that are so mind-blowing. Oh, I got to go back and tell you one more. When I said I changed my clothes to get on my bike that day, the shirt I put on was the Museum of Death. I have a collection of T-shirts from around the world, from CERN in, in Switzerland, Italy, in Switzerland, to concerts that are legendary, to, to Stonehenge. I got a T-shirt for Stonehenge. And the one I put on that day was the Museum of Death in Hollywood. They sheared it off of me, and I have it saved. I actually have a friend in Ohio that's trying to stitch it together like Frankenstein's monster so I could wear it for fun. The synchronicity of events, at, as I started to bounce back and realize I'm not going to die and I'm not going to be institutionalized, like, well, I don't have a backup plan. I was convinced by doctors and specialists throughout the world that this was hopeless. And so I started wondering, well, did this set of events happen not for me at all, but for me to document them as an already established and skilled writer and author? Obviously, 
everybody that has an NDE feels this impulse like, okay, I got to go save the world and wake them up to spirit now. And that's a very common feature of NDE. But there's a, a slight difference. Most NDEers that have that impulse, they weren't spiritual before. Many of them were agnostic at best. Many of them were, were less. Most of them weren't. And so the NDE even woke them up spiritually and made them realize, oh my God, this is all legit and true. And of course, when I was struggling and going through so much suffering, I was wondering like, why not why it happened to you? Why it happened to me? I was already spiritual and living my life this way. So I don't know why you had to wake up, but why am I going through this? And why are you able to walk away with virtually no scratches? I got severe brain trauma. What's going on? And as I started to document the medical part of the event itself, the only way I could explain what was happening to me was to elaborate it from a spiritual context. And it turned into this book, which is, as the title says, I don't know if you can see the poster in the back, a near-death experience memoir and a guide to spiritual awakening. As I described and explained the events and occurrences I was having, I had to explain what they meant and how I knew them. I'm not just telling you my opinion. I'm telling you through my story and through these events, what it means. And these are verified by the eternal truths within Sonnets and Dharm, within Buddhism, within the biblical studies. There's consistent themes with all of them that they share. As different as all religions are, there's consistent eternal truths within all of them. And so everything that I'm reporting on and sharing with, I'm backing it up by saying, this is, comes from this, this comes from that. And so when I say guide to spiritual awakening, it's exactly that, is you're getting this experience and you're getting where it comes from and what it means. And that again, I think was the difference. And I have since realized that I was used. I think celestial and spiritual forces used me to make a point and make a very clear argument and evidence. And I think if you hear these things that I just described to you from the t-shirt that I put on that day, to the canceled clients, to the paramedics on the corner, even an atheist has got to be like, okay, wait a minute, there may be something more to this than I, than I, than I, than I, than I think, right? And so I felt somewhat obligated, as many people end of years do, to tell the story. And as, a, as an award-winning author now, and having the writing skill since I was pretty much born, it seemed what I was called to do. Now, I wasn't and still have never been upset that I was exploited spiritually. I had a conversation with the Akashic agents, which I do often. And it was kind of like, I said, why me? I'm nobody, I'm nothing special. Yeah, I've spent my life studying in scholars, being a religious scholar, et cetera, but why me? And the answer was, because you're willing. Because basically, you're a crazy motherfucker and you'll do anything. And I am. I am a servant of the Lord as we all are. And I don't care what she wants from me. Kill me, bludgeon me, crucify me, exalt me, give me bliss. Whatever she wants is all I want to do, is all I want to be. So I was given these cards and, I'm, and I was dealt them and I'm playing them. How did the Akashic agents appear to you when you were in the portal? That's a very popular question. And it's funny because every time I hear it, it's like I never heard it before. Because I'm always like, huh, you know, that, it is a great question. And I'm, it's a natural curiosity. And so when I was in the, within the portal, it's, it's a formless, dimensionless, timeless space. Okay. Now I'm not saying that that's universal. Other people do experience presences and forms, etc. And again, I was asked, do you want any of that? And I was like, nope, I'm good. So it was more of an energy and more of a light or an aura. And so I definitely experienced their presence as kind of an ochre orange, which I explained in the book that was ochre. Now this is for me, the Akashic agents customize your death experience to fit you. I'm not going to see your grandmother passed on. I'm going to see my own. I'm 
a Hindu in India, they have the near-death experiences there too. They don't see Christ. They see Vishnu, you know? So it's customized to you because, again, God is omniscient and omnipresent and, can, and, and omnipotent. And so the orange aura, you could say, that I perceived was because my guru, my spiritual master, is an enlightened master, an enlightened acharya being. And, and I'm not just saying like in some metaphorical, symbolic way. He's a real individual that walked the earth like the Buddha, historical, documented, living, teaching for 90 years on this planet. He's absolutely amazing. I was at his feet many, many times. And so the God power took more of that form for me, the orange ore, because a sadhu, an acharya, a pracharik in India, they wear the orange robes as a sannyasi. So I didn't really want nor need nor was given a form. For me, God does have a form. A male and female form. And they are beyond my perception and conception because God is beyond our, our, our perception and conception. So therefore, I'm not qualified to see God's form because all of the all of these true spiritual eternal truths teach you this one basic thing, as, as Jesus did. When you have complete and total surrender, you will see me in my form before you. And that's it. You're done. That's eternal. I'm not qualified for eternal God realization yet. And so, therefore, I wasn't given that vision. Once you are qualified to see the actual direct eternal divine vision then that's it you're done no more reincarnation no more death experience you're done i'm not qualified for that yet i still have to evolve spiritually and do some more work not on this planet for people or anything else like that i have to continue my journey to become worthy of which one of the main things i realized that in order to become worthy of god realization is to realize that you ain't never worthy you ain't never going to be when I had that realization is when I, for the first time I ever felt somewhat worthy to realize that I'm not worthy and would never be worthy. I felt there was a presence saying like, now you're getting it. <laughs> That's, that, that is the most worthy thing you've ever thought and said is that you're never going to be worthy. And again, it's hard to say without tears because I'm not worthy of her love. I'm not worthy of her presence. I'm not even worthy of being aware of divinity. And yet I am because she loves all of us indiscriminately, unconditionally, eternally. So I've never required, needed, asked any type of a form or presence in that way. It's much more of a mental and emotional connection and I'm completely satisfied. I never, it never even occurs to me to want or need more or less. Whatever they give me, I'm just blown away day by day that I'm even considered. Why, why me? Like, I am, a, I am a worthless, stupid human. And so the fact that they bother with me at all, I'm just grateful. You've been a student of Hinduism for many, many years. Now that you've had this time in the portal, and if you look back at the scriptures, is there anything within the scriptures that describe the portal? Great question, Jeff. Thank you. Great question. I explain this in great detail in the book. And, I, and again, what I do is hopefully what you'll see as you converse with me is I try to do it in a fun way. I'm not like an academic scholar where I'm giving it to you like a classroom, like a, like a teacher. I make it fun. I try to make it conversational. And so, I'm sorry, I got lost in my own suit. Say, say that again. <laughs> the portal within scriptures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. So, there's a chapter in this book called The Portal where I describe what it is. So I figure, you know, you're reading this thing. I'm going to refer to it all the time. You're going to know what it is and how it works. I'm not going to be able to recite the names to you because it's Sanskrit and they're like multisyllabic. But for example, the, the, the purgatory dimension within, within Abrahamic religions, same thing. The in-between state between life and death where you're pending, where you're waiting to see what you're going to go. I can't think of the Sanskrit name because it has like five syllables to it, but there is a Sanskrit name. In Buddhism, they call it the bardo. In Tibetan Buddhism, they call it the bardo. The bardo is the in-between place where you go after death before you reincarnate, where you can 
take stock of things in your life, preview and review and prepare and get a view of what you really are. So every religion, every qualified, authentic religion has it. Now, as you refer to Hinduism, your true name is called Sanatan Dharm. Hinduism was a made-up name from the British when they colonialized it, okay, and it stuck around. And even in India, most people still refer to it that way, even though they are familiar with the Sanatan Dharm term. Dharm, as you probably know, means truth, spiritual truth. The only true Dharm is spiritual Dharm. Sanatan means eternal. So the true name of the religion is the eternal truth. And that is all we're concerned about. And this is what exists in every religion. And so the, does that answer your question? Was I going right? Basically, yes. I'm just curious if there's anything else within the scriptures that will describe what you saw there or experienced. So, yeah, and I'm sorry. So, so yes, I would say that every religion, again, every Indian year that you speak with, and you speak to a lot, every Indian year you speak with, they have their own version of it. And again, the, all of the authentic scriptures from every religion have their own version of it, and they qualify, and there, there are consistent themes and threads between them that make them unmistakable. Again, the eternal truths are eternal truths. You can't change them just from religion to religion. True, authentic religions, which most, which, you know, there's 10 or 12 of the, the, the really true, authentic, eternal, ancient systems, they all speak of the same kind of thing in different language. Now, as a hermetic scientist, you could say, Western mysticism, hermeticism, I'm a third degree ceremonial magician, have been for years. I'm a master alchemist, literally qualified, certified, and love it. So the Western forms of mysticism were my first kind of paths that I, that I was pursuing. They're all talking about the exact same thing in different ways, different dialects, different terms, because from region to region, you got to shift it. You can't go to the North Pole and start talking to people about and give them metaphors about desert and hot, you gotta give them metaphors that they can relate to. And so every region, as the eternal truths migrated from region to region throughout the world, and they came from east to west, they had to adapt to the different cultures and the regions that they were, they were taking place at that time. And so they all have one true eternal source, the eternal truths. And for me, as I went down the rabbit hole, the way I become a religious scholar and an expert is because in the beginning, I thought it was all bullshit. I was the king of doubters. All I saw when I was a child is conflict and confusion and intolerance in the world, and every one of them were justifying it with religious excuses. Our God says this, therefore that's the way it is. And I, as a child, I was like, I'm going to learn this so I can defeat them in debate. I can show them that they're full of crap and the religion is, 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 is bogus. And as I became a scholar in my youth, something surprisingly happened. As I studied scriptures and religion to debunk it, I saw the beauty of them. And to quote one of my favorite gurus and masters who said, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. Jesus didn't say, sit on your ass, it'll happen. He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. I may have begun my search and my knocking for the wrong reason, to prove it wrong. But as I went down that rabbit hole to the underground stream of truth, I found the truth and I found the beauty of it. And as a matter of fact, one of the next interviews that I have coming up is with an atheist group. And I'm looking forward to it because they're respectful. And I've had a lot of great discussion with atheists before because they're very cerebral. And my approach to, science, to spirituality is very, very scientific. It all just makes sense. There's evidence and proof of it everywhere. So each religion does indeed have their own version, you could say, which are universally pretty similar of a portal of another side dimension and they even, they even have names for it and they describe them in detail. And they describe what it's for and what you should do with it. Many near-death experiencers will say that the other side is more real than here and this side is like a dream. And 
what's popular now on YouTube is that this realm that we live in is like a simulation. In Hinduism, they talk about this as an illusion. Can you comment on that? I can, and this is also explained as these are the most prevalent confusing areas that I think people need to straighten out. And again, I'm trying to just, I'm just explaining them as they come up. So in Sanatan Dharm and in Buddhism, in the Eastern spiritual paths, it's called samsara, which you're probably aware of. So maya is the name in Sanskrit for the material phenomena, the world, the universe, et cetera, the material phenomena. Samsara is different. Samsara is the Sanskrit name for it, its nature of being illusory. It's not real. And so the truth is, while many factions of the Eastern paths marry into this notion that the entire material phenomenon is just an illusion, doesn't really exist, it's all in your head, the reality is what the Sanskrit texts truly say is not that it's, it doesn't exist. They're saying your perception of it is an illusion. It is real. So today, where I'm at, it's going to be 100 degrees out. I hate it. I do not like heat. Okay. But I know some people that do. I see some people driving around with their windows down. And I'm like, that guy's crazy. And yet when it's cold out, I got my window down. I'm loving it. And they think I'm crazy and I'm loving it. So there is an objective, absolute, factual reality. And that is, it is 100 degrees out. That's objective truth. That's the material phenomena. That's real. What I think about it, I hate it. This guy likes it. That's samsara. So what the Sanskrit texts teach, and even the biblical texts actually teach when you go beneath the layers and see the truth of it, what they're saying is it's all real, but your perception of it is the illusion. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. And this is what the Buddha taught. It's neither good nor bad. There is simply a true objective experience, and that's it. And an enlightenment is when the subjective reality goes away. What you think and perceive is, is nothing but what it is and being able to see it for what it is. And what it is, what you also experience in many ways in the NDA event is it's perfect just the way it is. It doesn't need to change anything. The flawed, it is, I will say, there, I'm quoting my own book here, which I just came to me. I say that it is perfectly flawed and flawed perfectly. How did you take the name Krishnanand? I don't get to ask that very often. Thank you. Um, so. I was born, my name is Scott Spackey, and I, again, if you Google Scott Spackey, you'll get a ton of stuff out there. My career was pretty prolific, and I had a good, I had a good presence, and I did what I think was very good work helping people, and so that's my Western body's, that's my, ident that's, my that's this lifetime's body name, my material name. Krishnan is my soul's name, and this is because in 2000, 10, and that's also described briefly in the book. There's a little quick passage about this. I explain the relation between uh, a, a human, a stupid human. I refer to stupid human in a fun way. We're all stupid humans. We're not enlightened. So we're just stupid humans. Is I'm explaining my relationship as a stupid human with my my divine master guru, who is a real living thing I could see and touch, not just not just some some akashic agent. And so in 2010, when I was in India, I went to I was at his ashram for a couple of weeks and I went and asked if he would change my name and give me a soul name give me, and reveal to me my soul's name. And that's kind of a common thing within Indian religious cultures. It's called, um, I can't think of the Sanskrit name. It's in the book. Nam, I don't know, something Sanskrit. And so it's a very common, you could say ritual. And so when I went to see him at like six in the morning and I went into his room and I sat at his feet there's the emotion again. That's because, you know, when you when you associate with or even think of a divine personality, it you get filled with a joy and it's something indescribable. It happens to a lot of people. So again, pardon me. As I sat at his feet, and he only speaks Hindi, and I don't speak that. And so his assistant is explaining to him why I'm there. And there was no big ritual. There was no big fanfare. There wasn't like an oath or anything like that. He simply said, your name is Krishnanand. 
And that was it. And I'm sitting here at that moment thinking like, I'm trying to contain myself because I'm at the feet within inches of a divine personality, an Acharya that is, that is legendary to this day, really huge. And I'm just trying to be normal. And so like, oh my God, I'm like at the feet of God right now, you know? And I walk out of the room a few moments later and there's a whole bunch of devotees that are waiting there in the little waiting area. Oh my God, so what, what do you name you? They're like all excited. I'm like, and, I, and I'm, in, I'm like stunned. I'm like, Krishna, I'm there. They go, they go, oh my God, really? I go, yeah, I, I mean, I'm so like, I, am so, I don't even know what's going on. And they're blown away. And they explain to me, that's the name of his grandson, number one. And secondly, that's Krishna's bliss. So Krishna is the divine love person, male, for, male personification of the divine love form. So there are many gods and goddesses in Hinduism, but Radha and Krishna are the male and female personification of the divine love essence. So they're not just almighty beings at all. They simply are playful and intimate and sweet and loving. It's nothing confusing or, or really not much knowledge or power at all. It's just a straight intimate connection. So I'm not worthy of that name at all. I don't know why he gave it to me, but I'm grateful that he did. And it, I didn't use it. Within my spiritual community, I use that name. And it was post-death as I'm trying so hard and desperately to restore my life back to what it was because I had a great life before my death experience and I'm struggling so much. And I'm trying to restore it and I have this, this aha moment. These Akasha gays were like, you dumb why don't you? Why don't you just listen to us and pay attention? You're not Scott anymore. He died. You're Krishna Nand. Why don't you take that identity? Stop trying to be something you're not. I was in Washington at the time, living by myself, waiting to die, when this kind of came through, and I decided right then to go by my name, my soul's name, Krishna Nand, that he gave me full time. And immediately things shifted. As her to live under this new vibration, again, the readings that I do as a numerologist, as a tarot, Kabbalah, I Ching, I use people's names and birth dates, as we all do. And your name and your birth date are the vibrations you live under, astrologically, et cetera. These are, the, these are the mechanics that the celestial forces use to help guide your karmas and your identity, and et cetera. And the moment, almost overnight, the moment I stopped trying to, to live and can continue to persist in being Scott, and accepted and was like, no, I am Krishnanan. I felt different and things started to just totally shift. So Krishnanan is my soul's name and was, was given to me by my guru in 2010. A lot of people in this realm are suffering and unhappy. What kind of life advice can you give us all? The Buddha said, his first noble truth, life is suffering. Second noble truth, the cause of suffering is desiring. Third, to end suffering, you must end desiring. Good luck with that. The fourth, you can do this in this lifetime. Good luck. Then he outlaid the eightfold path. Now, understand this. The eightfold path is not what makes you enlightened. The eightfold path is how you prepare to become qualified to do what takes to be enlightened, which is just a moment of realization. So life is suffering. So the reason he gave us these four noble truths is so that we could feel that we're not crazy, that your suffering is authentic, it's legit, it's real. You're not depressed. You're not suffering in, in any kind of defective way. Your suffering is the dark night of the soul. It is cathartic. And it's where you begin your soul's journey is when you realize the world is shit and only spiritual is where you can find happiness and bliss and love. Everything else is temporary and everything else is limited. So the suffering that everybody's in is because they keep trying to extract happiness and love from the world, which doesn't have it. They're trying to get water from a stone. And so the advice that the Akashic agents, that is in all the scriptures from time's beginning, from before time's beginning, is stop, stop, stop trying to seek happiness in the world. You ain't gonna find it. Do, 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 start, start, start seeking happiness in the spiritual. 
and do not try to be happy. Get out of the way. Surrender your will, your heart, your spirit, your conscience. Surrender your being to the God power, and they will make you happy. But the, uh, the paradox is that as you become more spiritually evolved and aware, be careful what you wish for. Because the Buddha also said it is the best and worst day of someone's life is when they realize enlightenment is a real thing. The best day because they now know why they're here and what they need to work on, what they're living for. It answers, why am I here? The worst day because they now know they will never, ever be content or happy without it. This is why his fourth noble truth of you can do this in this lifetime is because he also said the best and worst day is followed by it is only a matter of time before they become enlightened because they will never stop trying. They'll pursue it for the rest of their lives and through eternity once they become aware of it. So we're suffering because we're looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing. Do not try to make material happiness. It'll, it'll come and it'll go. It'll be temporary and it'll be limited. Only spiritual love and bliss is eternal and infinite. And I can't think of the word where it expands upon itself. Ex exponential. It is exponential. Spiritually, I'm blissed out and I'm happy. Materially, I, this place is dull. I literally have seen and done it all. I am one of the few people that doesn't just say that metaphorically. I've traveled the world. I'm a scuba diver. I've been successful. I've been poor. I've been killed. I've been a dope fiend. I've been a criminal. I've, I'm a father to a son who's a grown firefighter. He's an amazing man. I've got the blessings and the curses. I've done them all. I've, entire, I've really truly have experienced the entire human spectrum of almost the entire areas. And the world is ultimately a dull and boring place. And yet, I still wake up here every day and I've got to make the most of it. So I do. I try to see the blessings. I am not just on a tennis court swinging around a tennis rag when I'm supposed to be dead or a vegetable. I'm aware of it, mindful. As I'm swinging that tennis racket, taking a walk. And somebody might look at me and say, oh my God, why are you crying, you, you, you wimpy? What is wrong with you? I'm like, because I'm aware how what a miracle it is that I'm walking. And you should be too. Two acharyas, two masters were walking together thousands of years ago in India. This is a Sanskrit parable. They're taking a walk and they're walking together. And one guru says to the other, So what's the strangest thing you've ever seen? And the other guru says, Every day you see people that are mindless of death. They have no awareness that they could die at any moment and they're not pursuing truth. They're killing time and they're wasting it. And this is what one guru says, this is the strangest thing that I ever see that people are mindless of impending death. I'm not saying we should dwell in some kind of depression about, oh my God, I'm going to die. We should absolutely feel the glory of the rarity of being blessed with a human incarnation instead of an animal one. The true human in this lifetime. Do not waste human consciousness because only in human incarnation can you achieve spiritual liberation. Animals can't do it. They don't have that ability. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just that that's their incarnation. Only in a human incarnation can you progress on your soul's journey. So don't waste it. If people want to find out more about your book, is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon in paperback. And here it is. And again, if I may share with you, if you see on this little poster behind. Now there's this, this gray line on the cross because this is a galley copy. So this may be, I have to proof it so I can send it back to the printer and say, yes, this one, this is my final proof, my galley. So I'm saying yes. And then it goes on sale in a couple of days. By the time you broadcast, it'll be on sale on Amazon in paperback. So this yantra is an 11 point star, which you'll see here tattooed on my arm. It was a vision that came to me soon after my NDE. 
This Yantra is an 11 point star with 12 lotus petals that represent the heart chakra, the Anahata. There's layers of this that have meaning. And so the audio and ebook are for sale right now on withinthe-portal.com. They are instant download. They are beautiful. I put my heart and soul into this. I gave my life to it. I literally died for it. <laughs> and the print should be available on Amazon and many other booksellers by the time this is broadcast. Um, so it's available. Also, withinthe-portal.com. I try to give as much away as I can. There's a free workbook that people can just download instantly. And that's about learning and understanding what consciousness is and how to use it to spiritual agenda. I have a lot of fun with mysticism. I've got workbooks on Kabbalah, I Ching, numerology. And again, I try to make this, see when I had to study all this stuff, which I studied volumes of mystical paths, it's very academic and it can be pretty dry and pretty boring. And I've always tried to distill this knowledge and wisdom into things that can be fun and exciting. So when I read A Garden of Pomegranates on, on Kabbalah, Tree of Life, and it's this big by, by, by Rigardi, Israel Rigardi, it's huge, okay? And it's tough to get through. And I feel I've done a pretty good job condensing all of that into a workbook that's like 40 pages so you can use Kabbalah and have fun with it. So the book is available now. Instant download and audio recorded by me in my own voice. You can have my inflections and my emotions. Yes, there are times when I get a little tears there too. And I, I thought about editing them, but I couldn't get through some of the paths without them anyway. And so those are available. Some of the services, I also offer my services as a spiritual mentor and trainer. And again, I'm not a guru. I'm not a master. I'm not enlightened. I'm a stupid human that has a body of knowledge and information experience. And so people can often hire me to be a spiritual mentor or trainer. The same way you use hire a fitness trainer. I'm a spiritual fitness trainer. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. If you're open to that, should they do that from your website? Yeah, within the portal.com, I believe has, um, so there's, again, there's readings that you can, that you can purchase there. And each one is custom made. So like there's an application you're going to apply to get one because I don't just crank them out like algorithms. And so, but yes, I can be contacted and reached out to for any services, advice. I'm here to teach. And um, also, what was I going to say? Um, oh, sorry, you were just asking me. That was very, very important to kind of plug on something that people need to know about. Um, Yes, they can contact me through there. I don't remember what it was. The website has a lot of stuff. I try to give them as much away as possible. I mean, there are blogs that give you the primers on the numerology, on the astrology. And again, it's not just about predicting things. It's about how to use the true reason that Kabbalah's tree of life and tarot is indivisible from it. Tarot came from Kabbalah's tree of life, not the other way around. That doesn't exist independently. These are not paths for predicting the future. These are tools to use to evolve your soul's journey, to be able to work with them, mystical methods, to be able to evolve spiritually and soulfully. So this stuff is there. The services are there. And I encourage people to go, oh, that's what I was going to say, is that anyone that wants, that makes a purchase from that website, whether it's a reading or a book, if they use Mara 93, we'll give you a little code there, then they'll get a discount. And I don't remember what it is. I think it's like, a. I think, oh, I know what it is because I got to choose it. It's a four, it's a 16%. Now, keep in mind that as with this book, the, the cover of it, even saying the code being Mar, um, Mara 93, that's your last name, right, Mara? Actually, that's my wife's name. The podcast is named after me and my wife, and she's the editor, but it's fine to use Mara 93. So yeah, so Mara 93. So again, the point is that that's not some random number. I chose 93 because 93 is, in the mystical culture, 93 is the vibration for Thelema and Agape, which in Greek means will and love. Everything from the price of this book, it's 2093, because I use the 93 vibration. Every page, every, out, every outline, everything about it is handcrafted for this. So even the, when I'm saying 16%, which is I think what I told the publicist this morning, 
is 16% because it equals seven. Everything from the page numbers to every word on the page to the way it's constructed to what it's offered at, I'm trying to imbue this with vibrations and frequencies that help people, that are in theme with their spiritual growth. So Mara 93 is the code. If anybody wants to download the book in audio or ebook from straight from the website, they use that code and they'll get a discount. Krishnanan, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I have a guru and my spiritual teacher. My spiritual teacher was like his number one disciple. He's the one that first I was interacting with. And I would go to see him. There'd be room full, rooms full of people. And people would stand up and ask him about their problems with their family, their kids, their careers, and all these kind of things. Here's this spiritual being who I also was absolutely confident that he was truly enlightened and already divinized. And he's kind, he's humble, he's patient. But because I'd been with him so long, I knew what his answer was going to be to most of those questions, which is, do your sadhana. They're worried about their kids, their money, their health, and all this. And he's a spiritual personality. He's not your financial guru. He's your spiritual teacher. And he's going to say, and nine times out of ten, I'm thinking, I know what he's going to say. He's going to tell them to do their sadhana. Sadhana is spiritual practice in Sanskrit. And so I have the same answer. Whatever you're seeking, whatever you're unhappy about, don't try to resolve that. Do your sadhana. In Be Here Now by Ram Das, he quotes a very famous Vedic text, a very Vedic, fam very famous Vedic quote. He quotes it and says, in the beginning, you do your sadhana. And in the end, sadhana is all you do. This simply means that as you practice your sadhana and spiritual path, don't just do it metaphorically or theoretically. Do the work. Meditate. Train it. Study it. Don't just think you know what you're doing. Learn from the acharyas and masters that come from, that are timeless. We don't need some new age teacher. I'm, what I'm teaching, what I share is not my truths, they're eternal truths. And so do your sadhana. And eventually, you don't have to do your sadhana because sadhana is all you do. Eventually, the lines between your material life and your spiritual life become so blurry, you cannot make them out anymore. It becomes all one congruent theme of a spiritual existence. So the parting words I would say is, the advice is, do your sadhana. And if you, if you need help how to do your sadhana, well, then go to within the portal. And I'll share with you what the acharyas, not what I teach, because I don't teach you anything. I share with you what the eternal acharyas teach you from their Sanskrit, from their, from their text, from their teachings, from their timeless, from the Buddha, from the masters, from Shankaracharya, from these masters, not mine, the eternal truth. Krishnanan, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you for inviting me and having me. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.